Acts chapter number 20, lots of places to go from today. Remember this, is, we're, uh, we're observing the whole new year today. Uh, just today, because today is January 1st, and it's a great day to start a new year. You know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What better way to start a year than in church? There really isn't a better way, is there? Be in church and hear the songs of Zion. Uh, fellowship with God's people and enjoy the, the preaching of the Word of God. Well, Acts chapter 20, I want to direct your attention a certain way. Acts chapter 20, look at verse 22. Now behold, Paul speaking, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I want you to notice that, finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now, I know it's a long passage there. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it is Paul leaving uh, his friends, his very dear friends, saying he's probably not going to see them ever again. He's going against spiritual um, um, warnings. In fact, the Holy Spirit tells him that bonds and afflictions await him. And he's going back to Jerusalem to preach the gospel to people who probably won't listen. And all of that in that context, he says, I want to finish my course with joy. I want to finish my course with joy. Would you equate joy with bonds and afflictions? You probably would not. We probably would not. Would you equate joy with the rejection and uh, all of the uh, terrible things they did to him? Probably you would not. Do you know that joy is a very scarce commodity anymore? Joy is pretty unusual in even the homes of God's people many times. There's fussing and arguing and strife and contention, and those things should not be. Hey, it's two different people living under one roof, and there might be friction, but it should be a time of joy. If he can go back where he knows that bonds and affliction, that is jail and beatings, are going to await him, but he does it so that he might uh, complete his course with joy, then we should be able to... Uh, pursue our lives of service unto the glory of God, and He, in turn, gives us the joy of God that passes understanding. Now, this it's a scarce commodity. It's em the world is empty, and it's empty of, of uh, joy, isn't it? And yet the problem is Christianity is very willful today. The Bible speaks of grieving the Holy Spirit of God, of quenching the Spirit of God, and those are things that uh, unless you're a cognizant of, you might actually be doing. Do you stand here today and say, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength? It can't be because everything's going well. He's leaving dear friends that weep on his neck and, and they weep the most because he's not going to see them again and he goes to almost certain death, but he speaks of joy, doesn't he? You know what's wrong with most people? Most people just squirrel away uh, their Christianity with a certain part of their life, but it doesn't fill every day's life and every day's awareness. We are Christians, first of all, and we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Unfortunately, willfulness of Christians uh, diminishes joy too, doesn't it? There's a marked difference between Saul of Tarsus and Paul the Apostle, isn't there? Saul of Tarsus, it doesn't show us any joy that he had in his life. Saul was religious, and he was a, he was a celebrity in religion. He profited above many his own age and his own times. He had risen to the height of his, of his religious uh, uh, career, but he had no joy. But on the other hand, by the way, he was probably wealthy, too well off, had it made. He had probably a home in the suburbs, if I had to guess, because he profited above many of his own people and his own nation at that time, and he left it that he might preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. He left security and uh, maybe position 
for the joy of the Lord that comes with some persecution. You know, the Bible has wonderful stories of David, the shepherd boy, leaving a tent and going to the palace, doesn't it? He was a king, but he was born as a shepherd boy and he followed the sheep in the wilderness. But there's a couple of examples, like, for instance, Moses, who was raised in the palace and, and left it for a tent. But wasn't Jesus one that left heaven's palace, came to this world, and became a servant of men? And wasn't it Paul as well? Paul left the wealth of religion, prestige of religion, and he exchanged it for the persecution for the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Hey, the gospel is not popular in this world. People get upset when you talk. I got a letter. I said, what do you think of this, Nora? Didn't have any idea, and it was addressed to the Golden family at our address. Have any of you ever gotten that before? The Golden family? But it was our address, and I thought, what in the world is this? Uh, I might pursue this a little bit. It was from someone trying to encourage us to get on the Jehovah's Witness website. I've never heard of anything like that. But religion does that. Religion thinks that you're really hot stuff, or if you're, if you're a born-again believer, then you're really impressed with yourself. No, I'm not impressed with myself. And a golden family, they don't exist. I do know a man after God's own heart, and he had a messed up family. Isn't that right? The doctrine is essential. He speaks of sound doctrine. He preaches sound doctrine. But joy is something you determine. In verse 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. He determined to finish his course with joy. You know what's going to give you joy along the way? Seeing your kids and grandkids trust Christ as Savior. Seeing neighbors and friends trust in Christ as Savior. Seeing your kids and grandkids grow up and have a home that's not only happy, but one that serves God and puts Jesus first. That's what's going to give you joy. In other words, it's spiritual things. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to give you joy. And in Revelation 2, 4, it says you've uh, done this and you've done that, but you've left your first love. Doctrine's important. It's crucial, isn't it? Sound doctrine is what saves you and what gives you a purpose in, a, a, uh, in, in serving Him every day of your life. But you determine to have joy or not. Are you going to rejoice with Him? Are you going to rejoice in Him? The rejoicing should come naturally. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy is the second one. Why is it so many people live almost a joyless existence? It's not because Jesus did not do enough for us. It's not because the Bible's not powerful enough. It's not because uh, we're, <clears throat> it's hard to fly with the eagles when you have to serve with turkeys. It's not that at all. It's because we're not willing to leave the joy and happiness of friends to go and preach the gospel to people that probably won't even accept it. The gospel's not that important to us. How many times have you determined to serve the Lord, and then nothing came of it. How many times do they tell you on January 1st, make some determinations for this new year, and by January 2nd, you've forgotten them all? No. Joy is something that's worth preaching about, isn't it? And it's something to plan for. We'll look at it right now. Let's pray. Lord, just bless this time together. I sure thank you for this remarkable man, Paul the Apostle, who left religion behind and... Uh, and all of the extreme extremes of that religion and made the joy of the Lord his strength. Would you bless us today and help us to look inwardly, Father, not horizontally, but inwardly. And may your spirit guide us into the truth of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, in Acts chapter 20, this whole passage, I read quite a bit. You know why? Because in verse 22, it starts telling us about the communion that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ, with his spirit. Now behold, I go bound the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. When the Holy Spirit of God speaks to your heart, are you aware of it? Are you aware of it? 
If we're told not to grieve the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God tries to save you some heartache and you ignore Him, doesn't that grieve the Spirit of God? You know what happens when you tell someone that you care about uh, a better way to serve or a, a better way to look at things and you try to show them what the Bible says about their situation, they don't do it. It kind of grieves you, doesn't it? What about when the Holy Spirit of God, who absolutely knows what you should be doing, who absolutely knows the truth, who absolutely knows the path you should take, and He makes that plain to you because if you're saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God's within you, and He'll never leave you nor forsake you, and you turn your back on it. And then eventually you quench the Spirit of God. Why? The Spirit of God's going to plead with you, and you get tired of saying no. And after a while, the Spirit of God, the, the pleading of the Spirit of God, which was once probably more of a whisper, now almost becomes uh, unhearable, inaudible. Why? Because you've quenched and grieved the Spirit of God so much. But when it comes to joy, it's going to start out with communion with God. That communion was a daily, a daily walk with the Holy Spirit of God. Daily. If the Spirit of God is telling you bonds and afflictions, await you? Why would you go up to Jerusalem? Because souls await Him too. Souls await Him too. Do you understand the leading of the Holy Spirit of God? In chapter 21, you see in verse 4, finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, these disciples by the Holy Spirit told Paul that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. Look at uh, verse 11. It says, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit of God was actively working and telling Paul what to expect, and Paul went anyway. You say that's rebellion? Hey, it would be easy for him to say, I, uh, I won't go because after all, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. But you also notice the last part of verse 11, shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. All Paul was doing was he wanted to see someone else of his own people saved, though his ministry was to Gentiles. He was successful among the Gentiles. He went back one more time to speak to people that probably wouldn't listen. Do you love people that much? So that you're willing to speak even though it's probably going to cost you. And he reproved his friends there where he left in chapter 20. And he said, why do you make me weep? Why do you make me weep? I want to, I'm ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. What do the bonds and afflictions mean to him? He's willing to die that he might have a chance to win just one. Just one. Just one. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit speaks to your heart in 1 Corinthians 10. And when you are tempted, He gives you a way to escape out of that temptation. Do you ignore Him? You know what joy starts with? Fellowship with God. Communion with God. Uh, 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 communion with the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 14 speaks of preaching the kingdom of God. It's, uh, the kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Are you at peace with the Holy Spirit of God today? Probably if you are, there's a smile on your face. Probably if you are, you look forward to the Word of God as it's open. Probably if you are, you smile through the singing. It doesn't matter if you can sing or not. You just smile through the singing. Why? Because you want to be around God's people. I don't know about you, but I can't even look at the news. I can't even look at the news. There are so many lies and liars and then people that uh, continually lie to protect the liars and expose as liars the people that tell the truth. But when you come to church, it should be a different crowd, shouldn't it? I love to see these kids out here. And boy, tonight it'll be fun to watch those kids take these buckets around and extract an offering from people. I guess that's not the right word, is it? get an offering out of people, and they'll pay, bring in, you know, money because people are glad to see these kids excitedly going around giving. I love being in God's house, don't you? And folks, I've loved being in God's house whether I was a preacher or not, whether I was a pastor or not. I love being in God's house. Peace and joy and the preaching of the kingdom of God. You know what the kingdom of God is? 
hey, the world out there is a mess, but you can have it right on the inside. And for all those years since the day of my salvation, God's had it right on the inside of me, and He's speaking to try to make the outside right too, isn't He? You know where, commun you know where joy starts? With communion with God. But here's another thing about communion with God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, when you preach the gospel to people, you are laboring with God. You're laboring with God. Now, that doesn't just mean laboring that God's inside of you and you're working hard. It means that God's working with you and through you to accomplish His purpose in this life. When you go out and knock on a door and tell people about Jesus, invite them to church, be certain of this. You're doing God's work and He's there with you looking over your shoulder, isn't He? His Spirit is speaking to you and giving you the words to speak. Do you labor with God? If you want to know what communion with God is and you never do anything to serve Him, you're missing out on a whole bunch of it. That's what churches and what Christians probably are afflicted with more than anything else. Well, I have my private time with God, but you never do anything for Him. And most people around you may not even identify you as a Christian. I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. When you labor with God, He gives you the words to speak, as we see in the book of Mark. Last Sunday night, actually, He promises His presence to go before you. And by the way, when it speaks in 1 John 1 of communion, if we say we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That's not talking about being saved or lost. That's talking about believers. It's written plainly to believers who have so accustomed themselves to ignoring the Spirit of God that they say great big swelling words, I walk with Jesus. But no, really, you're walking in darkness. You've just gone back to the old ways of walking, the ways that the flesh is familiar with, trying to impress people, trying to uh, gain something in this world instead of giving your life to serve others. Someone gave their life to win you to Jesus. Might be a Sunday school teacher. Might have been a preacher. I think some of you got saved on foreign, uh, in foreign lands in the military. I think Jason said you did. Hey, uh, you labor with God, you should have a thirst for the Spirit of God. You should serve the Lord in love and sacrifice. You should pursue the sanctification of your own heart. That is, you're saved, you're kept, you're sealed. But Lord, let me set my affection on things above. Uh, let me set that affection. Show that to me. Remember, there comes a time where, just like David, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord your God. There's going to be a time when it seems like no one's there to lift you up. But you're not alone. He promises never to leave us or forsake us. What would happen if no one was around to help you? What would happen if you were alone with your own thoughts? What would happen if you were alone with all that you've learned about your Bible? What would happen then? What would happen in David's example when even his men sought to kill him? There comes a time when you are left alone with the Holy Spirit of God and you encourage yourself in Him. If you haven't done that before, when push comes to shove, you'll be out in the cold. You won't know what to do. It might be that's the time when God gives you the best lesson He can give you to, let, to sh show you that with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in your heart, you have all you need to have joy and happiness in this life. All you need. Your joy and happiness cannot be contingent upon other people's behavior because people aren't going to behave, are they? And you know, communion with God is leaving this world behind. I like a word in Romans 12. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means you lay your all on the altar each and every day. Here I am, Lord. Do with me as you please. Uh, take care of my thoughts today, Lord. Sanctify the words that come out of my mouth. Let your spirit have power. Let me not resist your spirit in my life. But it says, be not conformed to this world but be uh, uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what the word is that I, I'm thrilled about in that? It's our reasonable service. There's nothing above and beyond the call of duty. I was in Dover one time, walking down a hallway at the Air Base and looking at the stories of all the Medal of Honor winners and how each one won that. I could spend hours in there reading every one of them. 
That's for valor above and beyond the call of duty. You signed up to represent your country and defend your country, but some people take that so seriously. It might be that the actions around them and the disaster around them and uh, uh, calls upon them to give more than they ever thought they had to give. Well, surrendering yourself to God is not uh, above and beyond the call of duty. It's merely reasonable. He paid the price for your sin. It's reasonable that you give your life back to Him. He owned you. He, he redeemed you. You belong to Him. It's reasonable to say, here I am, Lord. What would you have me to do? That's what Paul, from the day of his salvation, he showed that every day of his life. No, he wasn't perfect. There are places you can look at and say, well, he probably didn't need to do that. He could have done that better just like every one of us, but you know what? His objective was to use his life to bring glory to God. Every breath, every day, in every way, it's reasonable, not above and beyond the call of duty. So it starts with communion with God. But then, how about consecration to God? In verses 23 and 24, the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Would you go somewhere knowing full well that it's, you're not going to have to dodge bonds and afflictions? They're going to come upon you. You can't hide and get away from it. If you're going to go there, it's going to be a battle. Man, I appreciate the character of this man, and really I appreciate the affection he had for his own people who didn't return it. Bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I in my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He consecrated himself to God. He could have, he could have sat back and set this burden aside and said, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I don't need to go back to Jerusalem. But you know, his love for people, his own people, his love for his own people was so great that he would sacrifice his life to let someone else get saved. We don't see that much anymore, do we? Sacrifice our own life that someone else might have eternal life? I was thinking this morning, you know, I wouldn't mind being a missionary in Sweden. I know I'm Swedish. I'm Swedish. I don't have a a burden, I, I surrendered to the mission field a long time ago, and God said, this is your mission field right here. But I don't, I know a few Swedes. I've never been to Sweden. When I find some, when I stopped at the guy whose farm had a big sign out front that said, the Don Bergstrom farm. Knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm Don Bergstrom. I mean, I know a few of those instances, and I'm typically not shy about that. But when I think about my grandfather leaving Sweden 120 years ago and coming to this country, I'd love to go and preach the gospel in the town he left. I'd love to do that. But would I do that knowing that I'd probably be arrested, put in prison, tortured, and ultimately die? That's what Paul's saying. Swedes are not... Um, probably not as nasty as some of the Jews are. The Jews are very religious. I don't know if the Swedes are or not. But Paul went back there in spite of being warned over and over again that bonds and afflictions awaited him. He had a burden that outweighed his safety, didn't he? He had a burden that could have been set aside by excusing it. He was an apostle of the Gentiles. Yet he wanted an audience with religious leaders and God gave him an audience with religious leaders, governors, and kings, and so to such an extent that he had converts even in Caesar's own household. He was the apostle of the Gentiles, and God turned his burden into further blessing amongst the Gentiles. Amazing, isn't it? You know what you see in him and what contributes to his joy? He had a burden for the unlovely. He had a burden for the unlovely. It, the Bible says one of the greatest tr principles in the Bible and greatest doctrines is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You haven't shared the gospel with very many people before you find someone that says, God couldn't save me. 
you don't understand how evil I've been. But that's who he came to die for. Didn't he? He didn't come for the ones that are, are all well-groomed and cleaned up and are impressed with themselves. He came for the one that won't even raise his head. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He had a burden for the unlovely. He was a horribly abused by the Jews. It tells us that uh, five different times the Jews gave him 39 lashes. I'm pretty sure you'd remember each one of those, don't you? Lashes that would rip the skin and hide off your back. Why did he go back there? Because he had a love for them greater than his self-preservation. Do you have love for people like that? We are left in this world. It could be that this is the year Jesus comes back. I said the exact same thing last year. Could be this is the year he comes back and takes us home. I hope he does. But do you care enough about lost souls that you would do that? When you do care about lost souls, you know what? There's something strange that goes with that. It's the joy of the Lord because you're doing his work. They horribly abused him. They hounded him. The Jews would follow him from city to city. He's not even in Jewish communities. He goes to another city and Jews follow him there to stir up the crowd to destroy him. And he wants just one more time to go back there. Maybe he wanted to see another young, zealous Jew, religious Jew, get saved and pick up the mantle where he's leaving it. I don't know. Generally, the Bible says the more, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 to the Corinthian church, yet the more I love you, the less I be loved by you. Why? Because even Christians, that's written to believers at a church. Even believers say, who do you think you are to tell me that? Who do you think you are? Just because, I mean, the Catholics believe that, that if you speak ex cathedra, then it's just like the Bible. That's just not true. Nothing compares to the Bible. But the Bible tells you how you should live this life. And as you study your Bible, as you see that Bible played out in the lives of all kinds of different people, you gain uh, with the Holy Spirit of God an insight into some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Do you think a young man or a young woman today who has no interest in spiritual things, who cares nothing for souls dying around him, who has, spends no time reading his Bible, no time praying, no godly father would let his daughter anywhere near him. No godly father would let his son be interested. Too much of the time, that's reflection of the spirit of a home. You know what that home should be? It should be a husband seeking to please his wife. That's only the Bible. While his wife is seeking to please him. That's what it says, 1 Corinthians 7. It should be a husband who loves his wife as Christ loved the church. And Christ loved the church in spite of my failings, in spite of your failings, in spite of the fact that you were willful and you did what you knew you shouldn't do, he still loved the church, didn't he? He still loved the church. They hounded him. Generally, he was unloved. Generally, they resisted him. I was thinking about this this morning. In Philippians 1, See if we can't make him more miserable by preaching the gospel to people where he can't do it. And you know what? He still wanted to go back to Jerusalem. He still wanted to go back there and sow the words of life amongst the people he knew all too well. <clears throat> the gospel is that important. And if the gospel's not important to you, I suspect you've traded joy for entertainment or pleasure. Did you hear that? The devil likes to, likes to counterfeit joy with pleasure. We live in a day when pleasure's all that is ever promoted. So the sa sanctity of the marriage bed is turned into recreation. And people won't be happy that way. 
they won't be rejoicing. There won't be any joy there. And perversion always follows. Number three, there's a concentration for God. Look at verse 25. Now behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. You know what preaching the kingdom of God is? <clears throat> if you look at Romans chapter 14, we've seen it many times. Romans chapter 14. You want to know what the kingdom of God is? Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's speaking to those people that are conflicted over gray areas. Should we eat meat offered idols or not? No, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When I got saved, I was immersed in the Holy Spirit. It's righteousness in the Holy Spirit. It's peace in the Holy Spirit and joy in the Holy Ghost. He preached that to these people. Do you realize that in the days of the Roman Empire, you better have things right or they're going to go after you too. They'll go after you. And many times throughout history, people were willing to turn in their neighbors and try to buy favor somehow, just like we see is coming. We saw it in Mark last week. Turn in other people to try to curry favor for themselves. Righteousness and peace and joy. You know what you're preaching? You're preaching, it doesn't matter what the world does around you. And yes, the world is dangerous and I could give my life for this, but I have righteousness because of the blood shed at Calvary. I have peace with God because my sins are forgiven. And I have a joy the world knows nothing about. My linebacker friend, um, Steve, do you remember Jason Crebo? He's a good friend of ours. And when he won that first national championship, I've said this before, he's a linebacker. And I remember at the University of Montana Stadium, people would hear him hit people, and it would, it would reverberate across the stadium. He's a big guy. But he won a national championship against Marshall. I think he was a sophomore. When he came back on that plane, he said, I've played football all my life. He was good at it. I just won the national championship. How come I still feel empty? He preached for us at a camp me at our tent meeting one time. Why do I still feel empty? And it's because of that that he got saved. Hey, this world can give you success. It can give you uh, accomplishment, but it won't give you the joy of the Lord. And Paul just wanted those religious people to know the joy of the Lord. He preached the kingdom of uh, God, and it's what produces joy. He, Jesus Christ overcame the world. Why does the world have such a hold upon our hearts? He overcame the world, didn't he? Joy is not the same thing as pleasure. Joy is not the same thing as pleasure. I think one of the best examples of that is the Philippian jail where Paul and was it Silas? They were beaten, put in the darkest part of the jail, and at midnight, they started singing praise to God. Listen, if you'd just been whipped with a cat of nine tails, singing might be the last thing in your mind. But I also have this idea that when they are there, they realize they're taking a small share in the abuse that Jesus Christ suffered to give us eternal life. They're realizing that this brief instance has absolutely um, minuscule meaning for eternity. And after a while, they probably started singing songs about uh, suffering. And then those songs about suffering or loss or heartache turned into songs more of rejoicing and it made an impact on the people in the jail, apparently impacted heaven because an earthquake was so fierce it freed them from their bonds. I love that. Peace and joy. In verse, uh, the last part of 24, it says, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? The grace of God means that God spares you what you deserve. 
and gives you something you don't deserve instead. Isn't that something? He's preaching the grace of God. Religion knows nothing of grace. Religion is all about reputation and all those things. My heart broke when I saw that the Pope Emeritus died. You know why? He has no certain knowledge of going to heaven. I doubt seriously he did. Their doctrine says you can't know that. Their doctrine says you probably have sins that weren't paid for, so you got to go to purgatory and suffer long enough till you're worthy of it. That's just not Bible. And the worst kind of dupe is a religious one. The worst kind to convince you to believe something that just isn't true and you lose your soul over it. The grace of God. As long as yourself is on the throne, there's not going to be any joy. The good news, that's what the gospel is. The good news is grace. God takes you just as you are. And his whole purpose was that he might finish well. That he might finish well. You ever think about that? I remember coaching soccer kids at my school in Tucson. A lot of my soccer players were girls. We didn't have enough to to play, and we played a team, and we had a really good couple of boys on that team. We played a team that we really didn't have a chance against. We lost the score, but the victory was they all came and said, man, you put your heart on that field. That's finishing. Our girls were tougher than their boys, and I'm not exaggerating. They left their heart on the field. They gave it their all. That's all Paul wants to do. I want to finish well. I want to give everything I've got. And you know, you won't do that if you don't determine right now to do it in the year to come. Why don't you determine to win someone to Jesus this year and get them discipled and added to our number? If everyone did that, if every family just added one person, it would double the size of our church in a year. And by the way, that's not so that we can count them. That's so someone else could pass from death to life. There is no way you're going to have joy lost. No way you're going to have that. You want to finish well? Think of our ease and the softness. I've seen those pictures that, you know, the greatest generation, the greatest generation as soon as Pearl Harbor was bombed, they stood in line for hours to join the military and protect our country. Today, they fight over which, which bathroom they want to use. Hey, tough times make tough people. Easy times make soft people. This is not the cry of someone that's soft or, uh, or wimpy. Paul says, my life means nothing to me. What means something to me is the souls of these people they're going to spend eternity somewhere. He wants to finish well. If this is your last year in this world, how are you going to finish? How's it shaping up for you? If this is just the beginning of the rest of your life, which it is for every one of us, how are you going to put Jesus in the middle of your life so that God blesses the next few steps you take? That's what you need. Verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. You know what he could say? There is no one that can say that I never witnessed to them. There is no one that didn't hear from me when I could have spoken to them. I wish I could say that, but I can't. But I witness to everyone I can. Do you? Do you know what a joy it is when someone says, yeah, I'd like to get saved? Yeah, I'd like to get saved. You know what sometimes makes the difference? A little spoiled brat goes into the military because he doesn't want to be told what to do. Goes into the military and gets a little character and then he comes out and he's willing to listen. He wouldn't before. He wouldn't before. If he got saved, why shouldn't other Jews respond as well? That's all he wants. Go back and tell the gospel to them. And you know what rejoicing boils down to? First of all, communion with the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost dwells within you if you're saved. 
Do you let him have his way in your life? And by the way, that joy comes from telling the truth to people. No, it's not many ways to heaven and uh, God bless you in whatever way you... Pers- no, there's one way to heaven. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And by the way, joy comes in neglecting nobody. Nobody. The one that's the most mean and obnoxious, they might be the one that responds. You don't know. It's not the Spirit of God saying, don't bother. <laughs> you know that. Joy and rejoicing come from giving your life in service. Ask yourself this, are you filled with joy of the Lord? By the way, when you're filled with the joy of the Lord, you have strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It'll take you through tough times. It'll take you, it'll, it'll help you to finish well. It'll take you through abuse and maybe smile even at the abuse, but you keep going. Is your home happy? Is your life dedicated to him? Do you spend time with him each day? Are you growing in grace? Today's the first day of 2023. I've already written down 2023 once, right here on my paper. It's the first day of the year. Are you filled with joy and determination to let this year be the year that you make a difference for him? And why wouldn't you? Most people figure that you can just skate through life and you won't be enjoying the joy of the Lord. Verse 35, look at that. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know what Paul's life was from the day he got saved? He must have received a lot while he was religious. But from the day of his salvation, he honored that truth. It's more blessed to give than receive. I'll give my life to preach the gospel to you. I'll give my resources to preach the gospel to you. I'll give my comfort to preach the gospel to you. Because at the end of the year, you can look back and say, man, several people have gotten saved this past year. That's a joy. What about you today? I don't know of anyone here that's not saved, but if you're not saved, this is something that you yearn for during the preaching, but you don't know for a fact. Are you saved today? Are you rejoicing today? Are you busy sowing the seeds of the gospel to people? <coughs> Are you willing to sacrifice whatever it takes? Your life. And do you enjoy the fellowship, not only of God's people, but primarily the fellowship with the Lord? How that really they said of Spurgeon, when you walked with him in the woods, you, could, you had to pay attention to know the difference between him talking to you as a friend and him talking to God audibly in prayer. Why? Both were friends as, as fully and as, as uh, much of a blessing as they could be. Were you the friend of God? Are you a friend of God? What's your fellowship like today? Today starts a new year. Start your year out right. Let's pray.